Galatians chapter number six is where we're going to spend our time. This is our lectionary passage for today. And uh, this passage of scripture is a, an important uh, contribution, I believe, to all of the ways in which we as uh, followers of Jesus, certainly here at the Way Church, are attempting to continue to be faithful in a season and in a time where uh, literally the world is upside down. I had a long uh, opportunity to debrief and do some briefing with some friends and comrades in lots of different spaces this week. Amen. Hearing that COVID-19 is continuing, amen, to, uh, what's the word, evolve, that there is now a new COVID strain out here, uh, I think called BA5, and it is uh, uh, more contagious than the previous strains. And that uh, even if you have gotten uh, one of the first two versions of COVID, you, we are now susceptible to this new version of COVID. Uh, thankfully, we who are vaccinated, hopefully all of us are vaccinated and or boosted or doing all that we can. Uh, I, th I think that we're finding out that uh, this strand of COVID does not uh, cause more fatalities, but hospitalizations are up. And, uh, and it is, I think, incumbent upon us to continue to be mindful. And in, the, in that conversation, we were just talking about uh, the, 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 the power of uh, deception and how uh, so many of us uh, in this country uh, were so late to respond to COVID uh, with the level of intensity it required because we did not have trust in the source of information. And that, how many know sometimes uh, whoever introduces something to you can have a great amount of influence on the veracity or the, 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 the extent to which you hold that thing to be credible? Right. Amen. Amen. How many know sources are often determinative to credibility? Uh, that if a liar tries to tell you something that's true, you ought to be a bit suspicious. Somebody say amen. 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 Uh, but but if, if, if someone who is credible, who has a history of at least having some accuracy along with the words that they communicate, even if it's a difficult thing to hear, you are more likely to pause and give it some sense of a hearing in your life. Well, here in the book of Galatians, we find a very similar kind of credibility challenge. You find that there are many individuals who are now becoming uh, introduced to the way of Jesus, to the teachings of Jesus, to the salvation that has been taught through the life and the ministry and the work of Christ. And this this, this teaching, this, this new kind of way of life is bumping up against their former way of life. And there are those who are trying to wrestle uh, authority and credibility around whose gospel should we base our lives on. And this whole book is really about the Apostle Paul uh, attempting to not only lay out his own credibility, but to help those who are listening to be mindful that it matters who you give your trust to when it comes to issues pertain pertaining to eternal life and certainly the life you live today. How many know it matters? It does matter indeed. You know, it matters who you, who you put your eggs in the basket for. I mean, I, 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 I can recall uh, all kind of games that you play. And, you know, it's like, you know, I'm going to make a big bet on this one number. Amen. And, and I've watched folk, you know, make a bet on a number and the number don't come in. And they are devastated. And then I've seen folk uh, <laughs> make a bet on a whole bunch of different numbers. And then it's like, well, you know. Uh, you know, I, I'm spreading my, 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 my eggs around. Somebody say amen. Amen. I'm just, you know, I know we sanctify some of y'all up in here. You act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Amen. But how many know sometimes, you know, uh, when you don't have confidence in one thing, you'll put your trust in many things. But what happens when you put your trust in things that are contradictory to one another? 
Amen. Amen. You know, one of the biggest scandals in sports was when a person playing on a team would bet against his own team. Amen. It's like, you know, uh, I'm a, I'm a win whether I lose. And I'm a certainly win if I win. Kind of takes a little sting out your, out your loss, right? I'm a bet a million dollars on this game whether I win or lose. Uh, either I win with the victory or I lose with the money. But there comes a moment and a time where sometimes where you place your trust will greatly impact the trajectory and the course of your life. And so in this passage, uh, the Apostle Paul is trying to help the church in Galatia, a new church, a church that has been birthed in an environment that was pagan, as it were, in the biblical times. Pagan, to be pagan was not to be godless. To be agnostic, it was not to be an atheist. To be pagan during that time was to believe in all the gods. Because it was kind of like, we don't know which God uh, you, you may, you may uh, which God is the real God. So, so we don't, you know, upset whichever one is the real God. We just go and worship all the gods. Somebody say amen, right? Amen. That, that's kind of sound like the United States of America, right? We are a polytheistic country at its root. Religious freedom, it's a wonderful thing, but it also causes so many of us, amen, to actually put our trust in many things that ought not have your ultimate allegiance. Because over time, we can see that some may trust in things that are built on quicksand on shaky foundations. So here in the book of Galatians, verse number, uh, chapter number six, verse number seven, we're going to spend a few moments preaching about this very powerful concept, a concept that I think uh, has great bearing on us as we head into the 17th year celebration, but also as it relates to our own lives, our relationships, our 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 vocations, dare I say, the, the, the very way in which you and I navigate this season. Galatians chapter number six, uh, verse number seven, the scripture says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for you reap whatever you sow. And if you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. Verse 10, so then whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us all say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk from the topic just for a few moments. It will all come back to you. Amen. It will come back to you. Bow your heads and let's pray for a few moments. God, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing. That makes preaching and teaching easy. We'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. 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 Just pat yourself on the chest and say, it will come back to me. Say that it will come back to me. Now, I love the message translation of this verse. I'm just going to read it in the message real quick just to put it in some plain language uh, just in case uh, the new revised sounded uh, a little uh, 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 uh out of reach for some of us, all right? Message translation says it like this. Don't be misled. No one makes a fool of God. What a person plants, that person will harvest. The person who plants selfishness, ignoring the needs of others, ignoring God, harvests a crop of weeds. And all they'll have to show for their life is weeds. And they'll have to show for their life weeds. But the one who plants in response to God, letting God's spirit do the growth work in them, 
They harvest a crop of real life, eternal life. So let's not allow ourselves to get fatigued doing good. At the right time, we will harvest a good crop if we don't give up or quit. And right now, therefore, every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. Amen. This is a very powerful principle. It's an eternal principle. It's a principle that is not just found in the letter to the Galatians in the Christian scriptures, but it is something that uh, you will find in multiple religious traditions, multiple cultural contexts. Uh, you'll find it with religious folk, with agnostic folk, with fundamentalist folk, with liberal folks. This idea that what you put out in the world will eventually make its way back into your life. Now, depending on what kind of person you are, we should have a lot of joy about that. Or some of us may be shaking in our boots. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. I'm not saying anyone in here at the Way Church on a Sunday morning uh, is shaking in your boots because I know all of us put nothing but good things out into the world. Somebody say amen. Somebody say, help me, Lord. Amen. Amen. Somebody say, you don't know my coworker. You don't know my family. You don't know my roommate. Somebody say amen, right? But the case is still the same, that no matter who you are, it is true that we will reap what we sow. Uh, one of the prophets, you know, in a way that only the prophets uh, can really amplify this concept, says that if you sow the wind, you will reap the whirlwind. Amen. And that, that means that there's some kind of multiplication, multiplier, some kind of exponential thing happening when it relates to what we put out in the world. And could it be, child of God, that one of our great challenges, one of our great tasks as followers of Jesus in a moment where we are seeing so much uh, reaping happening, that we may have sown the wrong seeds into the world. We may have invested the wrong intentions into the lives of others. We may have even focused or emphasized the wrong issues or motivations in our own lives. And that the cumulative impact of what we've sown as a country, as a world, as a church, as families, as individuals, has created this implosion of sorts where we are now struggling to make sense of the world in which we live. I mean, I want you to think about all the many ways that we are being invited to reflect on this idea that as we live our lives, our lives are consistent seeds of sorts. That on my job, whatever I'm sowing on my job is creating an environment that I must endure. That in my community, whatever I sow into my community is creating and contributing to an environment that I must live through. Whatever I sow into my personal relationships, my family, my, 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 my children, that it is producing a reality that I must acknowledge God has given me and us the responsibility to steward. You see, child of God, the idea of sowing and reaping is an ongoing principle. Which is to say that in one part of your life, you may have sown a lot of trouble and you are reaping some trouble. <laughs> I'm not going to say a lot, praise God, because because how many know sometimes grace takes the edge off that trouble that's coming back your way. Anybody grateful for some mercy and some grace up in here? Amen. But but the fact still remains that you may have been in a part of your life where there was a lot of sowing of trouble. And now that you have 
Learn the error of your ways. Now that you have gone through the process of repentance, now that you have went through the school of hard knocks, you are realizing I no longer want to sow what I sowed in the past, that now I am going to take this principle to eternal, uh, its eternal end, and I'm going to now start sowing the things that actually produce a harvest of plentiful and good things for myself and all who are in my charge. You see, the great thing about sowing and reaping this principle is that it does not require an in perpetuity of a singular result, but you can at all times begin to shift up the kind of produce or the product that you receive. And God is calling for some of us to ask ourselves, what am I sowing in this season of my life? We've been here at the way for 17 years, and, 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 and if you take a look at the totality of, of the ministry that, that, that has been a part and parcel of the way, there's been at least 50 years of ministry sowing into the same space, the same group of people, understanding that over time, if you keep sowing good things, you will get a harvest that you could not even count or hold in your own hands. I want you to know, child of God, there's something great about sowing in a good thing over time. There's something beautiful about saying, you know, that I may not be able to reap the full blend, uh, blessing or the bounty of what I'm sowing, but I know that me sowing today will actually have a harvest that my children may be able to benefit from. Me sowing today may actually ripple throughout the community uh, far beyond what I physically could cover. I mean, can you imagine you investing in something that goes far beyond where you will even travel? I mean, that's the gift of why we donate to causes that we are passionate about. Because we know that my money may be able to accomplish something that my physical body could not do. That when I sow into a cause uh, in another state, when I sow into a cause in another country, I am being represented in that cause, even though I am solidly planted right here in the Bay Area. Well, I want you to know, child of God, that God is calling some of us to think about what are we sowing into our future? Who are we planting into things that will actually produce such a great harvest that even though you can point back to that one time you mentored somebody, you can, can look and say, you know, I didn't know that that one uh, lunch meal would actually uh, correct your whole life and now you out here actually helping dozens of folks. Or let's say you're a teacher, praise God. And you have had to, you know, spend a little time with, you know, the knucklehead in your class. Any, any, anybody ever had to spend time with some knuckleheads, praise God? Maybe not in your class. How about in your family? Amen. How, how, how about in your relationship? Amen. Amen. How, how many know you've been the knucklehead? Amen. <laughs> Patrick Seven on the chest and say, Amen. I'm reaping what I'm sowing. Amen. Amen. That sometimes you and I are unaware how sowing, how taking a moment out of your time could actually produce something much more grand than you actually moving without intentionality. And when we come to this text, it's so important to appreciate that Paul is speaking to a group of people who seem to be caught between what they should sow in. Now, some of them, because they're uh, Gal from Galatia, it means that they are not Jewish. They do not have the lineage of the Jewish kind of, 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 of bloodline. And so uh, if you were a Jew during this time, you had to be circumcised. And if you were not circumcised, uh, particularly the males, if you were not circumcised, then there was this teaching that you were not in right relationship with God if you were not circumcised. 
the male-centered nature of this whole religious practice. It, it often created all kinds of issues of inclusion and focus, but I want you to appreciate, child of God, that one of the great tasks that Paul had to deal with when he came to Galatia is that he had to help people uncouple some principles that were not necessarily eternal in nature, but cultural in their origin. That Paul had to help them realize that now that we have this gospel of Jesus, that is literally about the work of Christ on the cross. And many of us who are now being pulled into the life of Jesus, we all have shared in this experience with the Holy Spirit because we're still dealing with a little bit of Pentecost right along through here, right? That, that the Spirit has literally united us across all of our differences. That the Spirit has united us across our different geographic, our different cultural, our different racial differences. And yet you have some people showing up saying, wait a second. I know that you've, you know, accepted Jesus. I know that you've, you know, received the spirit. But have you been circumcised? And Paul is like, wait a second. <laughs> How is it that all that God has done in your life? How is it that you can allow someone to come in and actually reduce your whole spiritual journey to a physical practice? I mean, Paul is trying to help them to realize that, listen, you have sown in spiritual blessings. You have reaped all kinds of wonderful harvests of relationship with God. But now someone is inviting you to sow into a practice that only benefits your, your body. And I want you to know, child of God, that Paul had to do some work along through here to help them uncouple some misconceptions. The first thing that Paul said is do not be deceived. And I want you to sit with that for a second. Somebody, somebody holler, I can't be deceived. Say that I can't be deceived. That deception for the, for the writer, for the, the apostle Paul in this passage is a huge warning. Not to those who are outside the church. But Paul is saying deception is something that we inside the four walls, the ministry of our churches, ought to be very careful about. That deception, even in when it comes from those who claim to be spiritual and religious, is something that we must always be mindful of. And how many of you know that there's a lot of deception going on these days, amen, in the world, amen. There's a lot of half-truths being told. There's a lot of misconceptions. There's a lot of lies being told. And for many of us, because we have lost the ability to discern truth from fact, amen, we will base our whole lives on the faulty logic of a liar, of a deceiver, of someone who does not deserve our trust. And that is part and parcel of what you and I are always being asked to think about as we follow the ways of Jesus. Am I being caught in the deception of the enemy? Is the deception of the enemy causing me to believe that I should literally sow into my flesh the physical things, the things that are literally anti-Christ when I also have the choice to sow into that which is spirit. I mean, this is what the scripture says. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means that child of God, when we spend our life sowing into that, which is wasting away, you will literally reap more things that are wasting away. Think about how some of us have spent large swaths of our lives. <laughs> Amen. There's no hater. I'm not no hater up in here. I'm just trying to help us think a little bit. Amen. Think about how, 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 how much time some of us have wasted 
throughout the course of our lives. Think about the, the, the degrees that we have invested in. The professions, the vocations, the people, the places, the things. Do I have any honest folk that can say, I, I, I've sown in a lot of um, uh, corruption, a lot of uh, things that are literally passing away. I don't know about you, but it is sobering to see things that you've invested large swaths of your life in just disappear. <laughs> I remember I, I took the girls uh, last year, we were in the height of COVID, and, and you know, uh, some of our friends, they, they go camping all the time. Now, you know, uh, my version of camping growing up was sleeping inside, uh, in a dorm, in a bed with a locked door, and a bathroom. Somebody say amen. We said we going to camp. It's like, oh yeah, let's go to camp. It's just like, you know, a, a, a real low budget motel. <laughs> hey man, that, that's, that, when, I, when I say camp, you know, I'm a city slicker. I grew up in San Francisco, praise God. So, you know, when we said camp, camp just meant I'm getting away from the city. I'm gonna be around some trees, maybe a few bugs here and there, a little bit of bark on the ground. <laughs> hey man, that's what camping meant to me. Amen. But these folk, amen, they talking about tents and stakes and 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 all kind of contraptions I didn't know existed. They talk about putting string on the outside of your your campsite so so lions, tigers, and bears don't come visiting you in the middle of the night while you're trying to sleep. They 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 talk about campers that got showers on the back of the camper so you can like put up a little curtain around the back of your and you taking a shower outside. <laughs> they, they want me to go camping. I said, no, I mean, you know, I'll sleep up in this camper, amen. I'll lay the seat all the way back, and, you know, that'll be the extent of my camping. Amen, but they enjoy the camping. But, but I, I raise all that to say, you know, part of the experience of camping was to start a fire. And, you know, I, I'm a little bit of a pyromaniac, amen. You know, uh, I, I, I like to see things burn in a very fixed environment. And so, you know, we, 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 we would gather all this, this wood and logs. And we would spend hours trying to find the logs that are thick enough but not too wet because, you know, outside everything can get a little misty and dewy in the morning. And, and you know, uh, Nyla Morton Sarai, she loved the, the opportunity uh, to go find twigs and branches. And so we would spend hours carrying things to the little, little uh, uh, campsite fire pit thing. And we put all that in there, three, four hours worth of work all throughout the day. And then you light the match. And sometimes it don't, it don't take very fast. So, you know, if you if you really, really willing to, you know, work with that thing, you're going to, you know, add a little bit more twigs. You're going to find a little shrub. You're going to put it on the inside and get a stick. And you're going to keep working. And, you know, uh, for a couple hours, it took us a while because one of the logs the first night was too big. And, and, you know, we had to get it hot enough where anything you put in the fire would eventually be consumed. But what's so interesting about that is when you wake up the next morning and everything you had worked on the night before was gone. For a brother like me, it was like, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> How could I work half a day to pull something together and then it be gone overnight? It took my incentive, my passion, my motivation to invest all this time into something that you watch just go away overnight. Well, how many know some of us, the price of deception is that we will invest our lives in things that will disappear overnight. And what God is inviting us to do is to make sure that no matter what task you are doing, the scripture says, in all that you do, do it as unto the Lord. Why? Because whatever you invest in that is God's, even at the end of the process, how many of you know you will always have something left to build back on? Woo! 
I wish I could talk to somebody in here today. Amen. Part of the challenge that I believe we're having as a country, as a people, even in our own individual lives, is that we're sowing a lot into the flesh and it is yielding corruption. It is passing away. And we're aware because we see it happening right before us. But God is inviting us as we go through the course of our life. Make sure that whatever you invest in, you're investing in something that has some sustainability, some longevity. Dare I say you're investing in something that is eternal. And I want you to know, child of God, that there is an eternal investment that God wants you and I to make. And what does that eternal investment look like? Well, the scripture simply says this, we must learn to invest in doing what is right. How many know doing what is right is not always the popular thing to do? Amen. 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 Sometimes, you know, my dad used to say, you know, uh, if, 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 if the light turns green, and you see a car coming running a red light. You can go straight through that light because it's green. You'll be right. But you'll be dead and right. How many know sometimes being right is not always the life-giving thing to do? Sometimes being right is to hold your peace. Sometimes being right is to let the Lord fight some battles. Sometimes being right is taking the low road, meaning not letting no one walk on you per se, man, because I do believe there's some good called self-defense, praise God. You, you ought to defend yourself, amen. But, but I am telling you that sometimes it's good to just, you know, say, I, I'm, I'm not going to fight this fight right now, even though I know that right is on my side. <laughs> because I believe that the eternal nature of what I'm sowing in will outlast the wicked temporary schemes that you, my antagonist, is sowing in. And that's true in your job, vocation, your relationships. Uh, that's true with your children when you're dealing with school districts. That's true with the law system when you're dealing with injustice. God, I'm going to invest in what is right because what is right will have an eternal significance. That's why as some of these new laws are being overturned and passed, it's very important for some of us to start asking ourselves, what is it that God is inviting me to invest in that is right? How am I, as the scripture says, how am I to make sure, verse number 10, that whenever I have an opportunity, I'm working for the good of everyone? Not just myself. How many know some of our personal convictions need not be universal laws? <laughs> I wish I could talk to somebody in here. Amen. Amen. Some of my personal convictions need not be a universal law. Now, that does not mean that we live in a, in a world of relativism. It just means that at some points in history, your personal convictions may not keep up with the best information we have on hand. How many can be honest and he's humble enough to say, what I believe today may not be universally true? Amen. That's what history teaches us. Even through our theological journey to faith. How many know what folks understood about Jesus in the first century? They had to evolve to what they understood about Jesus in the third century. Not if Jesus was real, but the way that they talked about the efficacy of salvation. How many didn't know that what they thought about who was able to be baptized in the 14th century, it has all evolved in the 17th century. Not about the efficacy of baptism, but about the way in which some folk interpreted that which was true. You see, I said this uh, to some, some friends of mine who got a little, you know, Little, little bothered by it, but I, I'm, I'm, you know, at this stage of my life, I find it to be a bit true that the Bible is not the same as your theology, which is not the same as your doctrine. Amen, amen. 
the Bible, amen, the word of God that we have, you know, universally accepted as, 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 as inspired over time is not the same meaning. It is not equal. It is not equivalent to our theology. Your theology, our theology is an interpretation of the scriptures that our community has received. And then your doctrine, trip off this, is the part of your theology informed by the scriptures that we seek to focus in the course of our own uh, Christian community. Doctrine is not equivalent to theology, which is not equivalent to the Bible. So what does that mean? That means that we must, as the prophet said, come and let us reason together. Oh, you ought to just tell the person next to you, can we reason with one another? Praise God. Can, can we reason together? Can we have a conversation about how you read the Bible? Can we have a conversation about the conclusion you've come to theologically? And can we have a conversation about the application of your theology that produces your doctrine? And I'm here to tell you, all of the denominational fights that we've had and we continue to have are because our Bible is not the same as our theology, which is not the same as our doctrine. And can I tell you something? God seems to be okay with that. <laughs> you, 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 ought, you, you, ought to just, you ought to just tell yourself, God's okay with, with the conversation. Amen. But what God is never okay with is the violence. The violence that often is used in the name of God to make my biblical interpretation dominating your theology and often persecuting you for your doctrine. I mean, I want you to think about this. God, the creator of everything, literally everything, Things that you don't even know exist. I was reading, uh, I was reading, I'm, I'm getting a little tangential, y'all forgive me, but I was reading an article that said that they found a crab in Australia with hair on it. And I said to myself, crab with hair? Now, you know, I'm someone who loves to eat crab. <laughs> I don't think I'll be no hairy crab over here. Somebody say amen, right? With all of my knowledge, how many know there's some things I still don't know just yet? How many of you know there's some things you don't know just yet? Do I have any honest folk in here? They say, I got a lot of degrees. I spent some time at the feet of the best teachers and professors. I've spent my whole life in Bible studies. I've spoken in another tongue. I've rolled on the floor. I sweep from the chandeliers and I've levitated. But there's still some things. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Amen. I, I've been married once, twice, three times to a lady. Amen. I've, 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 went, I've went to every counseling therapy session. I've, I've went to every conference. I've invested millions. I've lost billions. But there's still some things I don't know just yet. Amen. I've taught in all kinds of schools and contexts. Amen. I've done everything. I've coached all kinds of teams. I've done it all. But there's still some things that I don't know just yet. And what does that mean? That means that I must keep sowing into eternal truths. Why? Because it is the process of sowing that yields good things. And that's my message for us today, people of the way. How do we keep sowing into eternal things? into good things, into things that bring healing and unity and justice and redemption. You ought to be able to test what you're reaping and it will give you a sense of what you're sowing. Hello, somebody. If you're reaping a lot of hardship, a lot of a lot of wicked results, if you're reaping a lot of a lot of a lot of things that are are literally moving you off of course, then I think God is inviting you and I to ask ourselves, what am I sowing? Because it is in the sowing 
that we reap a harvest. And I believe that evidence of us being here today. We've sown, we've been a part of a project of sowing for some years. And even though we're enduring pandemic upon pandemic, even though monkeypox seems to be on the horizon, how many of you know what we've sowed <laughs> eternally will continue to sustain us even through this season of corruption? So be not weary, as the scripture says, in well-doing. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Because the scripture says, you will reap a great harvest if you do not faint and give up. Stand with us on your feet, everyone. Let's prepare to pray. Come on and just... Think about for a few moments the ways in which this passage of scripture is giving you an invitation to reflect on what you are sowing and dare I even say what you are reaping. God, I want to be a part of a community that can always be clear about the sowing, the sowing of life, the sowing of hope, the sowing of peace and strength, the sowing that causes us to reap a good harvest. And so God, I pray for the person who I'm next to, who I'm beside, who I'm in front of and who I'm behind. I pray God that their life, oh God, would be overly characterized by the principle of sowing and reaping. First, God, I ask you to forgive all of us in this place today who at different parts of our lives may have been sowing in corruptible things. I ask you, God, to give us the ability, Lord God, to discern that even though I may have sowed in some corruptible things in the past, God, I'm going to make a U-turn. I'm going to repent. I'm going to shift my direction. And I'm going to now start sowing into the Spirit. I'm going to sow into things, oh God, that actually produce a good harvest. Relationships, I'm going to sow into good ground. My vocation, I'm going to sow into good ground. The acts of defeating injustice, I'm going to sow into good ground. My own mental well-being, I'm going to sow into good ground. My physical body, I'm going to sow into good ground. The way, Lord, that I receive my information, God, I'm going to sow into good ground so I can avoid being deceived by the forces that are constantly inviting me to sow into the flesh that yields corruptible results. So God, today I and we invite you, Lord, let your spirit be unleashed within us and among us so we can discern what is good ground. And God, I pray that it will happen today, immediately, the light would come on because we have little time to waste. We have little time to waste, oh God. And we want to be a people who has the clarity to sow into the Spirit so we may reap a good harvest. Lift those hands right where you are, oh God, and so it's me and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, it is not my father, my sister, or my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, and I need you, God. I need you to remind me that your spirit is at work in my life. I need you to remind me, oh God, that salvation is near to me. I need you to remind me, oh God, that redemption and second chances and healing and wholeness 
are near. I need you to remind me, God, that the victory that I seek in the struggle that I endure is as far away as the lifting of my hands. And I lift my hands and I pull down peace and joy and strength that I need for this day, for this week, for this season. I declare healing in my body is mine. I declare victory in my soul is mine. I declare salvation is mine. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on and clap your hands and let the people of the Lord, amen, say hallelujah and amen. In Jesus' name. Thank you.